All right, so we're starting a teaching series this morning, right? I know a lot of us are anticipating it, and I strongly believe it's going to um, bless us. It's going to be life transforming. I'm going to be speaking all through this month, um, the Sundays and wet um, Thursdays, right? On understanding the person, the patterns, or the person, the principles, and the practice of Christ. Understanding the person, the principles, and the practice of Christ. Last Sunday was Easter Sunday, but I want us to understand that in my own books, right, Easter is more important than Christmas. Because if Jesus came and he never died, we wouldn't have been saved. The most important part of the Christian faith is the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ. Not that he just came. Anybody could have just come. But the most important thing is what is coming did, right? He died and he rose. You see, I said this last week Sunday and it's, you know, um, it's what everybody knows, right? Um, every founder of every religion all over the world, where they are buried, right, can be traced. But the tomb of Jesus is still empty. It has even become a tourist center globally. Everybody goes there to go check. Why? Because it's not there. From the third day, the Bible says when the women showed up, the angel said, he is not here. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? And my prayer is that in this month of April and in the remaining days of this year, that will be somebody's testimony. Yeah. Uh, that when people look for you in your old address, they will no longer find you there. Yeah. That it will be said concerning you, why are you looking for the jobless among the gainfully employed? Why are you looking for the successful among the failures? That will be your testimony in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So all through this month, we're going to be studying the life of Jesus, right? Um, because we need to understand what is the conviction of our faith. The coming of Jesus, right? What's the purpose? Why did Jesus die? What does that even mean? What's the, you know, the, the importance of the death, of the burial, the resurrection of Christ? Why did he even come? What's the big deal? right what makes the christian faith different from every other belief on the earth right so we seek to answer that question all through this month and let's be reminded that this wednesday is deep dive right in case you don't know what deep dive is um uh, we believe that this wednesday is going to be a public holiday you know um Tuesday, Wednesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, right? So if it falls on Wednesday, that's going to be the date for deep dive, all right? So even the community group, just be on the lookout, right? But according to uh, many calendars, it says that Wednesday is going to be a public holiday. Now, deep dive is a growth and maturity boot camp. It's that time we come together to hear God's word, worship, minister to God. You know, there are certain things we cannot address, you know, enough time for on a Sunday morning service, right? Because maximum is Sunday morning worship experience is three hours. We don't even do three hours two hours two hours 30 minutes maximum is three hours and you cannot grow just you know um having a two-hour experience once every week and expect to grow that way it's impossible that's why you see that in the life of jesus there were several times he separated his disciples he would teach the public shortly right but when he spends time with his disciples he would explain a lot of things to them they would even ask him questions and that's one of the things we do at deep dive you know after you know um teaching we also ask questions questions about anything that has to do with the christian faith you see if, it, if i have the answer i'll tell you the answer if i don't have it i'm not part of the pastors that get their self-esteem from pretending they know everything if i don't know it i'll tell you i'll get back to you it's as simple as that we are still all we are all um you know on a journey is that okay all right so i would encourage you clear your shadows be a part you know of, of deep dive you know this wet day and i think we're having two or three this year is it three Everybody has a calendar, right? If you don't have the year calendar, it means you're not on the community group, right? So I'd encourage maybe the media team to share it again after the service in case some people want to join the community group again, right? So we have a year calendar. This is a very structured church. This is a church that believes in planning, right? So all our schedule for the year, right, is already there. And, you know, later this month also, um, the expressions, they are going to be having a stage production, you know. So it's gonna so that day they will be ministering to us in a drama. It's gonna be an amazing time, all right. And I think they are doing that twice this year, right? You guys are having it twice this year, all right? I think that's third Sunday or last Sunday, you know. But we're gonna get the announcement shortly. So understanding the person, the principles, and the practice of Christ. Let's start this morning from Ephesians chapter four, verse seventeen to twenty in the New King James version. When I need you to skip to King James, I'll let you know. So officially, um, New King James, all right. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to verse 20. Ephesians 4, 17 to 20. I strongly believe we're all in church with our voices this morning, right? It's impossible to be in church and leave your voice behind, okay? Because I need your voice this morning. So we're all going to read it together in concert from verse 17 to verse 20. Are we ready? Out loud together, one to go. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness. To walk all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. Now we'll see here Paul is speaking to the church in Ephesus. And the first thing he said in the 17th verse. He said you should no longer. Please realize that he wasn't talking to the world. He was talking to the church. So he was saying to them that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Why? Because as a believer, there are certain things that men should see in your life and they should just automatically know that this is a believer. I've said it over and over again that even the title Christian, right, is not the title you give yourself. It is the title people give you. So if you are the only one still referring to yourself as a Christian, introducing yourself as a Christian, and the people that have been interacting with you for a while, it doesn't occur to them that you are a Christian, something is wrong in the equation of your Christian faith. Because the Bible tells us that the apostles, right, Jesus even never referred to them as Christians. You see, that title Christian was a title given to the disciples of Christ by unbelievers. The Bible says they saw them in Antioch, saw the manner and conduct of their life, and said these ones are Christians. What does that mean? It simply means they patterned their life according to Christ. So, they had already known Christ while, you know, he was on the earth. They saw the principles of Christ, they saw the practice of Christ, they understood his presence. And when they began to see the disciples, they said, ah, these guys are Christians. It simply means they are like Christ. They are Christ-like right but you and i except we want to you know deceive ourselves we know that there are so many people today who call themselves christians all you need to do is to have a transaction with them and the question that comes to your mind is and you call yourself a christian it simply means even at the back of everyone there is a belief that there is a way a christian is supposed to conduct him or herself I hear what I'm saying this morning. That's why Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus. That you cannot afford to behave anymore the way the Gentiles are behaving. There must be a difference in your speech, in your conduct, in your relationship with every other person. There has to be a difference. And I love what it said in Ephesians 4, the 28th verse. It said, but you have not so learned Christ. You have not so learned Christ. What does that mean? It means following Christ. You have to learn it. In fact, let me put it plainly. You have to learn Christ himself. You have to. If you haven't learned Christ, your Christian faith cannot be complete. Because you need to understand what does it mean to be a Christian. What does it mean to follow in the footsteps of Jesus? Are you hearing what I'm saying? So Apostle Paul is saying you have not so learned Christ. What he was saying in essence, because you can't say you have not so learned Christ if they had not been taught how to follow Christ. So he was saying this is not what we taught you. This is not how to behave. This is not how to conduct yourself. This is not the things you learned from us. You didn't see this character in us. Where did you get it from? It simply means you have imported the world's lifestyle into the church. And let me tell you, this is never going to mix. We have a generation that wants to hold on to the world and stay in church. They want to follow God, want to love God, but they don't want to let go. You see, see, the essence of Christianity and salvation is death to something and resurrection to something else. You can't live both lives. You know, when I talk about having the best of both worlds, that's not one of it. You can't be in the world, right, and be out of Christ. That's why the Bible says that anyone that loves the world is an enemy of God. So Apostle Paul was saying to them, you have not so learned Christ. And that is what we want to do this, mo um, this month, right, to learn Christ. First John chapter 2 and verse 3 to 6. First John chapter 2 and verse 3 to verse 6. 1 John chapter 2 verse 3 to verse 6. The Bible says now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word. Truly the love of God is perfected in him. 
By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to do what? To walk just as he walked. So the walking here is not that you are copying the walking style. And maybe you just used to bounce. You two, you are now, no, 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 no. He's talking about his behavioral pattern. His conduct. His principles. His practices. So the Bible is saying here that if you say you are in Christ, you have to live according to the pattern of Christ. Make sense? Are you with me this morning? Yes, oh, I'm not prophesying this morning. Uh, so it's a teaching. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit leads me in that direction, I'll flee in that direction. But this is a teaching class. It's master class. Christ master class. <laughs> Praise God. You see, Jesus came to do many things. One of the things Jesus came to do, right, but not limited to, was to come as a template. So, there is something called the substitutionary work of Christ, and there is something called the pattern works of Christ. Let me give us illustrations. For instance, the Bible told us, you must have read the story already in the Bible, that there was a time, right, that the disciples were in the midst of a storm. Jesus told them to go ahead, that he needed to pray. And they found themselves in the midst of a storm and in the night they saw someone walking towards them and they thought it was a ghost. You see, and Peter later realized that this was Jesus. He was walking on the water, right? And Peter said, if it is you, tell me to come. And Jesus told him, come. And Peter stepped out of the boat, right? And also walked on the water to meet Jesus. You see, that was a pattern walk. Understand that there is no, there, there is, because there were so many things that Jesus did, the Bible told us, that if everything were to be recorded, all the books in the world were not going to contain it. So for everything recommended in the Bible, I'm sorry, written in the Bible, there is a message that God is trying to pass across to us. What is the message of Jesus walking on water? It is the message of having victory and dominion over your circumstances. It's a pattern. It's simply, see, and it's so amazing that when Peter said, if it is you, tell me to come. Jesus didn't say, are you the son of God? You better stay in the boat or else you will drown. What was Jesus trying to say? He was trying to say, if I can do it, you can do it. If I have dominion and victory over circumstances, over the elements of nature, you also can have that dominion. So he came to give us a pattern. If it were not a pattern, Peter wouldn't have been able to do it. Am I making sense this morning? You guys are looking like I'm speaking over your heads. <laughs> Praise God. Don't worry, just stay with me. Stay with me. I'm going to flesh it out very soon. You know? So, Jesus told him, come. And Peter did the same. Oh, some might say, but he drowned. Yes, but the part you don't remember is that he didn't drown completely. The Bible says Jesus stretched out his and pulled him out. And the place the Bible was silent about, right, is that Peter also walked back into that boat with Jesus. Jesus didn't carry him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because the Bible says, as he began to drown... As he began to sing, not that he sank, he began. So he hadn't gotten to the point where, you know, he was completely drunk before he cried out and said, Lord, save me. And the Bible says Jesus pulled him out. So that's a pattern walk that God is trying to tell us that as a believer, you must not be controlled by circumstances. You must control circumstances. That's why as a believer, I don't understand how sometimes believers just say, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm depressed. I, I say, let me on. I'm not saying depression is not real. But if you are always depressed, something is wrong. You don't understand who you are in Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because see, what you are going through that is depressing you, many people have gone through it and it didn't press them. Huh? Am I making sense? It's capacity. So it simply means you can get to a point where you become stronger than what you are going through. The same giants that they all, you know, they all military strength, might, of Israel ran away from is the same giant the 17 year old boy ran towards the difference was not the circumstance the difference was in the capacity and recognition of who he was because when David ran towards Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17 he said I come to you in the name of the Lord not I come to you as a skillful archer or a skillful soldier no he understood who he was now under the old covenant they didn't have that pattern as it were but you and I we have the pattern of Christ today so one of the first things Christ came to give us as a pattern, right, is that we can have victory and dominion over circumstances of life. Victory over lack and insufficiency. Victory over sickness and diseases. Victory over failure. Am I making sense this morning? Victory over the economy. 
So the fact that everybody is going through something does not mean you have to go through it. Do you get that? Everybody is going through it. does not mean that has to be your experience. Your case has to be different. Another thing we see in the life of Jesus that was a pattern, right, was that he casted out demons. And he told us to do the same. You know, I've said this over and over again. Sometimes you see, if the average Christian, right, see someone manifesting, they just step back. Ah, I respect myself. <laughs> but the average Pentecostal Christian can speak in tongues. Something is wrong. If you are speaking in tongues and you can't cast out devils, something is wrong. You know why? Mark chapter 16 and verse 17. Can we have it very quickly, please? Mark chapter 16 and verse 17. And you will see the progression. The Bible says this is Jesus speaking before he left his disciples after his ascension. He said, and these signs, can we all read out loud together? Will follow those who believe. In my name they shall do what? Cast out demons. They will do what? So how come you are speaking in tongues and you are not casting out demons? Because it's a progression. He said they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. So if you're speaking with new tongues, it's already a pattern. Why? We saw Jesus do that. You know, that can also be classified as dominion over spiritual realities. Am I making sense? There are times, right, if you're a sensitive believer, you understand that some things happening, they are not natural. This is a demonic interference. I remember many years ago, I was reading a book, you know, I, I think was going to get the book um, maybe next week. I think we need to read that book this month, um, The Believer's Authority by Kenneth Hagin. He said there was a time, one of the visions he had of Jesus, you know, and he was having a conversation with Jesus. And all of a sudden, a, a monkey-like demon ran between him, him and Jesus and created this dark smoke and everything. And he said Jesus was trying to tell him some things that were very important to his destiny, right? And he wasn't just hearing again. And he said he was just thinking, why is it that Jesus is not doing something about this demon? He said, and Jesus kept talking. He said because he could see that Jesus was still talking, but he was not hearing anymore. He said he got to a point, he got frustrated and he just said, stop in the name of Jesus. And the demon fell down and kept making noise. And he said, get out of here. And the demon left. He said, he now asked Jesus in that vision, why didn't you stop the demon? He said, because I've given you the authority. If you don't do anything about it, I will do nothing about it. Because when Jesus was on the earth, he casted out devils. He put demons in their place. He is no longer on the earth. That's why he says, all power in heaven and on earth. He has given it to us. Luke 10 and verse 19. Let's see that scripture. Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, 19. Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. The Bible says, behold, I give you the power to do what? Trample on serpents and scorpions. And over some, over almost, over how many? All the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by what? Any means ought you. Did he say, I'm going to give you? Huh? After you fast for 120 days. See, there is a deception. And let me tell you this. That we have exalted works above what God said. Many of us unconsciously will believe, ah, until I do like seven days dry fast. I can't do some things. If you have it, you have it. For instance, as a man, if you are eating a bowl of pounded yam and somebody comes to you, are you a man? Do you need to go and fast before you give the answer? Uh, ah, I'm eating. I've, I've not been fasting. No. I can't give you the answer. Are you going to do that? You are a man. You are a man. Whether you are sleeping or you are awake. Whether you are fasting or you are not fasting right now. Fasting, don't get me wrong. Fasting enhances the authority, but it does not remove it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, he said, I give you the authority. Because he doesn't need the authority in heaven. You and I need it here. So he has given it to us. And so when you notice in your life that certain things, you just realize this thing, ah, no, 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 no. This is a demonic interference. You can stand your ground and say enough is enough. Enough is enough. I hear what I'm saying? Enough is enough. Enough is enough. We also see Jesus sleep through the storm. The Bible told us that there was a time you know, they were in the midst of the sea and it was as if the ship was going to capsize and Jesus was sleeping. Sleeping soundly. What does that mean? It's a pattern. A pattern of rest. That in spite and regardless of what you are going through, you must learn to calm down. In quietness. 
Ah, that's where you're going to find your strength and your deliverance. Not in running up and down. Have you noticed that you don't find solutions when you're anxious? It's in the place of calmness. The Bible says when they woke him up, I was like, what's wrong with you guys? Just said, peace be still. And probably went back to bed. Entering into rest. Entering into rest. Entering into rest. Hmm. Also, we have the substitutionary works of Christ. And one of the substitutionary works, we see that in 2 um, Corinthians 8 and verse 9. Can we have it very quickly? 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Can we all read together? Want to go? For you know the grace, that's not everybody. Let's all read it together. Want to go? For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty, my what? That was a substitutionary work. It simply means for a believer. A believer has no business with poverty. It's a substitutionary work. The Bible says, He became this so that you might become that. So it simply means He took your place. When did He become poor? On Calvary's cross. Because during His earthly ministry, He wasn't broke. Some people peddle that idea. I don't know where they get it from. Jesus was, there was even nothing to infer that He was broke or that He was poor. You see, that's what the Bible says. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. It simply means he wasn't poor. The reason that poverty had to happen was because you and I so that we will not be poor. Am I making sense? Because the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18, it says that God gives us the power to get wealth. The power to get it. If a believer is going through cycles and seasons of poverty, is it that the believer is lazy or the believer is not hearing God? I hear what I'm saying. Or the believer is not hearing God. Or the believer is too proud to find out what it takes to get out of it. That's just a reality. Because it says that it became, okay, you've taken the scripture. It says, and you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you the power to do what? So he's not going to put the wealth in your hand. You have to get it. And did you notice it didn't say it gives you wealth. It says it gives you the power, the ability, the capacity to get wealth. Somebody say I have the ability. Yeah, you have it. It's in you. Another substitutionary work of Christ is we notice that in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17, can we have it please? Matthew 18 and verse 17. This is not even the crux of my message. I'm just trying to lay a strong foundation. Can we read together? Matthew 8, 17. Not 18, sorry. Matthew 8, 17. Matthew 8, 17. All right. Can we read together one to go? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself did what? took our infirmities and did what? If he took it, he did return it. It's a substitutionary work. So you see, the death of Jesus on the cross was not just the crucifixion like as somebody wants to. No, 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 no. It was something spiritual taking place. On that cross, he took your place and brought you into his own place. Am I making sense this morning? So the Bible says he himself took not he himself is taking. Uh, oh, maybe he has taken 50%. They see 50%. He took it all. He took it all. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Why? So that you may not have it. So that we may not have it. Hallelujah. Romans 8 and verse 29. Romans 8 and verse 29. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Why did I tell you everything I just said in the past couple of minutes? This is why. Romans 8 and verse 29. Can we read together one to go? For whom he did for no, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be what? The firstborn among many brethren. So the Bible is saying that the reason Jesus came is so that he might be your big brother. The firstborn among many brethren. And this is the predestination that everyone that will accept God as their father writes that they will be conformed to that same image. So that's what it's trying to say that Jesus came as a template. So every one of us, our goal must be to become that template. The easy to read version says, God knew them before he made the world. And he decided that they would be like his son. Then Jesus will be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. The Passion Translation says, For he knew all about us before we were born. And he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of who? Of his son. 
Not the likeness of an online celebrity. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Not even the likeness of your pastor in that sense. If your pastor is not looking like Christ, you better don't look like him. He says to share the likeness of a son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Oh, somebody say, Jesus is my big brother. Do you understand what that means? You know, there are some of us when you just think about your elder brother. You are going through something. You just remember. I don't know if you have, does anybody have a brother like that? Or maybe an uncle. Just, oh, once I call my brother, I'm fine. And the Bible is saying that the reason Jesus came is to make us understand that he is the head. He is our big brother. Somebody say it once again. Say, Jesus is my big brother. If you have a good big brother, a responsible one that is doing well, you are fine. You are fine. <laughs> Praise God. So what are the things we need to know about Christ that we need to pay attention to? Before I start, I want to talk about, um, the goal was talking about four this morning, but of course I can't get to four. Let me say this, and I want everybody to listen to what I'm about to say. Please listen. I want you to jack the person sitting next to you in case the person is in a dream state <laughs> and make sure the person is alive because you need to hear this you need to hear what i'm about to say god did not send the son jesus to the world to give you a big house and a big car the principal purpose of the coming of christ to the earth is for you to become like him you hear what i just said because if we are not careful the christian faith can be reduced to a casting that we're only following God because of a bigger car. Does that mean God does not give people bigger cars and bigger houses? That's not what I'm saying. That's why we have testimonies. God wants to bless you, but that's not the ultimate purpose of Jesus' coming. That's why he made us go through reading all those scriptures. Right? He says he came so that he might be the firstborn. That we might have a pattern. That we may be like him. That's the principal purpose. If you have all the cars and you have all the houses and you are not like Christ, you have wasted your existence. I'm telling you that. What's the essence? People see you come into church, you pray every day, and all you have to show is a bigger car and a bigger house, a growing business, and you are not becoming like Christ every day. You are a bad witness. You are a bad ambassador. As you are making progress occupationally, financially, socially, people should also see your life and see a character change. Ah, this pathological liar now has integrity. Wow. Amazing. That's becoming like Christ. A fearful person. We saw that in the life of Peter. A small girl told Peter. He said, Uncle Peter, you look like one of the disciples of Jesus. He said, never. I don't know that man. He was that afraid. An unstable human being. This was the same person Jesus said, who do men say that I am? He said, oh, you are the son of God. Peter was so unstable that God can use him this moment. In the next second, the devil will use him. So you don't know who is using him by time. Jesus said, oh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And Jesus began to talk, continued, you know, telling them that, you know, very soon he was going to be crucified because that's why he came. And Peter said, it will never happen. Ah. Jesus said, get deep behind me, Satan. <laughs> because Jesus understood, how can God reveal something to you now? And the next moment is the devil. Instability. I you know there are some people like that. They're so unstable. Not committed to anything. In fact, when they are committed, you are shocked. You are like, ah, ah. Uncle, what's happening? You have been coming to church back to back, back to back, back to back. All of a sudden, they just disappear again. And it's not that they decided they are battling with something. Somebody hear what I'm saying? Because nobody in their right frame of mind will want to live an inconsistent life. Peter, fearful Peter, on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Ghost came, the same Peter stood before thousands of people and preached Christ. The same Peter, when they said, you guys stop talking about this Jesus or we are going to kill you. He said, we cannot but speak of the things we have seen and heard. What happened? Fearful Peter had become confident Peter. No wonder the people saw them and said, no, 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 these people, they are Christians. Because the only person, you know, there was a time the Pharisees, and their leaders, they sent soldiers to go arrest Jesus. You know the mistake those soldiers made? They decided to listen to what Jesus wanted to say. They forgot their mission. The Bible says they went back. 
to the people that send them. And they asked them, where is the man we told you to arrest? They said, eh? Arrest that one. They said, nobody ever spoke like him. That was their mistake. They said, we can't arrest that one. No, nobody. That was the same thing that entered into Peter. Peter, that a little girl could change his conviction. You have believed in Jesus all your life. But a little girl was able to change your conviction within a split second. Or something switched. Something switched. I pray for someone under the sound of my voice this morning. That whatever needs to switch, that this morning God will switch it. In the name of Jesus. Whatever needs to switch in your character. Whatever needs to switch in your behavioral pattern. By the power of the Holy Ghost, may those things be switched in the name of Jesus. So the most important thing God can do in your life is to make you to become like Jesus. This is the house that believes in prosperity. We believe in abundance. And I say it, you know, unashamedly. You know, I say it without apology. If you are looking for a poor pastor, you have not found your pastor. Ah? Huh? And I also know you can't be a poor member. You can't be hearing what I'm saying, be practicing it, and your life will remain the same. So we are not disputing the fact that God wants to bless us. But understand that is not the initial purpose. That's not the primary purpose. Am I making sense? So we need to understand the balance. The prodigal son, he looked at his father and said, give me what belongs to me. God has no problem with giving you things. He has no problem. He took everything and lost it. When he came back to his senses, he went back to his father and said, make me. Because when you are made, you will have. But when you are given, you may not be made. When you are made, you will definitely have. Because success is not what you pursue. It is what you attract as a result of who you have become. When you become successful, it's not about the trappings of success. It's about the kind of person you have become. If you change location, you will reproduce it because it's in you. It's in you. And that's what God wants to make of you and I. And I pray that in this month of April, God will do a quick and a perfect work in our lives in the name of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 18, Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. The Bible says, but we all, New King James please, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being what? Transformed into what? The same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. What is that trying to say? Whatever you behold is what you become. If you behold Jesus, you will become like Jesus. If you are beholding other things, you will become like those things. I don't need to ask you what are you beholding. If you missed Thursday service, please get the message. I don't need to ask you what are you beholding. I don't need to ask you what do you believe. Over time, your life is a printout, a visible expression of what you are beholding. You see, life always reveals things over time. You cannot successfully deceive destiny, deceive life. You can't. You can't. Someone can say, I'm going to the gym. And all they do is to go create content there. Uh, over time, we will see that you really never go to the gym. Because if you tell us you are going to the gym, after six months, you will, you will see the sign. Okay, let's even say one year. The sign we show now. But if you say you are going to the gym, and instead of losing weight or becoming fit, it's the other way around. Or maybe before you could not you could climb stairs, huh? and now you just climb two floors, you're already panting. We know you didn't go to the gym. You can't say I'm reading God's word. See, <laughs> if if you do some things over time, it will show. Remember that me, oh, I, I read the Bible. I know when people are studying God's word because there's something about God's word, it's transformative in nature. You don't need to say, God, change me by your word. Mm -mm. Just be reading the Bible, you will be changing. You will just wake up one day. The disciples themselves did not know how much they are changed until after Jesus left them. They didn't know. There was never a time that Jesus sat Peter down and said, On the day of Pentecost, when you want to preach, this is what you will preach to. You will use this scripture, say this this way, change your voice this way. No. But Jesus knew, if these guys have spent this amount of time with me, something has been deposited on the inside of them. Hallelujah. Amen. You see that happened to um, Peter. When Jesus was going to heal, um, what's her name now? Um, um, the daughter of Jairus. The Bible says Jesus to Peter, James, and John. And sent everybody out of the room, locked the door, and raised up the daughter of Jairus. After the death of Jesus... Peter was going about his business one day and some women came to him and said, there's a woman that just died. This woman must not die. 
because she's a woman that has been of benefit to all of us. When Peter got there, you know what Peter did? Peter also sends people out, locked the door, and raised the woman. Where did he see that? From Jesus. So the way you are behaving reveals to us what you have been seeing. Make sense? So the first thing we need to understand about Jesus is pressing his principles and his practice. Number one, and this is very important, it's going to bless you, is that he forgave his offenders. He did what? He forgave his offenders. <laughs> you cannot be a Christian and not be a forgiver. No, 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 no. You can't. You can't be. Do you, do you know what it means for Jesus to, on Calvary's cross? Jesus saw the people that he healed, he saw the people he fed. You don't understand? If it were you and I, don't be. If I was the one, I would be tempted. I would just send back the sickness. Eh, you, they should crucify me, Abby. Take back your leprosy. <laughs> Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know what they, they don't know what they are doing. Ah, ah, Abba. Don't they really know what they are doing? Are they children? They are adults. But you know what a forgiver does? A forgiver creates excuse for the offender. And we saw that Stephen, who also picked up the patterns of Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, when they were stoning Stephen, you know what Stephen did? He said the same thing Jesus said. Why? Because you can't be a follower of Christ and not practice what Christ practiced. You can't. They were stoning Peter, um, Stephen. And the Bible says, Stephen said, Father, forgive them and don't put it to their charge. It would have called fire if it was Elijah. Oh. Elijah has no chills. <laughs> Thank God it's not Elijah that died for us. Every day when we are going out, we just be seeing barbecued human beings. <laughs> because we have no choice. We have to follow that pattern. The fire! <laughs> Burn them. <laughs> just could have roasted them from Calvary's cross. You, you that I, fire. Now, even when Peter brought out his sword in Gethsemane, right? When they were about to arrest Jesus and cut off the hair of one of those guys. You know what Jesus said? I said, don't you think I have access to legions of angels? All I need to do is just ask my father for one. All these people are dead. So we don't need that. Heal the guy. They wanted to come arrest him. It's not that they were coming to for his ceremonial welcome. They were coming to kill him. He knew. Yet, he healed one of them. He should have at least allowed that guy to go deaf in one year. Now, you guys want to kill me? I shall take this one as the part, <laughs> as passing gift. But he still healed. What is that thing that someone has done for you that you can't forgive? Are you hearing what I'm saying? I don't kiss it. There's one thing the Holy Spirit taught me years ago, and it has been a blessing. It tells, it told me years ago, and I've asked many people, and you must have even had me say it several times. What people do is their seed. What you do is your own seed. I will not reap your harvest. I will reap my harvest. So the fact that something did, someone did something to you, does not give you, see, as a believer, let me tell you this, it's a criminal offense not to forgive. In this, our kingdom is a criminal offense. It's not even a choice. Because of time, you know, you know today is um, praise party, so my message time <laughs> is a bit shorter. The Bible says that there was this particular guy. He was owing his master. In the equivalent of today's finances, it, said it was like $15 million. And the master said, you are hoeing me. You are not going anywhere. And this guy asks for mercy. Please forgive me. I don't have this money. I'll pay back. And the Bible says this. His master did not say, okay, I give you 30 years to pay back. He said, don't worry. I forgive you the money. You are free. And this guy on his way home, he saw another guy that was owing him the equivalent of $1,500. And the Bible says he arrested him and took him to prison. And what he did that someone forgave him for was the same thing the guy that was owing him did. The guy said, please, I don't have this money. I will pay back. Huh? And he said, you are going nowhere. He said, have patience with me. And he would not, but went and chewed him into prison. How, where did they debt us in money to pay police to arrest someone? But he said, when people are not forgivers, they will do anything to hold the offender. Will do anything. I'm always amazed sometimes when I see the degree at which some people will go 
to prove that you have offended me, I will show you. Should I submit this to you this morning? You are not a Christian. And when we give the altar call this morning, receive Christ. You are not. I'm telling you. No, I'm not saying that to be you, Moros. You are, because you cannot be a Christian. Because that's why I took time to explain what it means to be a Christian. It means you are like Christ. Has anybody assassinated you? Have they arrested you and you are in prison and you know that tomorrow they are going to crucify you? No. Have you fed 5,000 people and those same 5,000 people are saying, crucify him, crucify him. You just gave somebody a shoe. The person turned against you. The whole work and arrest. You say, and I gave you shoe. The shoe that even you, you yourself, you have rejected. Just fed people. Fed their families. And these same people say, crucify him. Away with him. Do you know how painful it is that even the man that had no business with Jesus, Pilate, he said, why do you guys want to crucify this guy? He has no business with death. And he said, okay, you know what? Let's... And you know what the people said? They said, give us a criminal. And the Bible says Barabbas that they asked for. Barabbas was in prison because he murdered someone. They said, give us a murderer. Away with this guy. And yet, Jesus forgive. I want you to ask the person sitting next to you, what did they do to you that you can't forgive? What? I was having a conversation with one of our ministers recently. I think it was during this week. I think some things just come with spiritual maturity. I was saying, I said, at this point, I think I've even, and I'm not trying to praise my book, it's because it's growth. If you understand my personality type, if you're an introvert, a melancholy, you are a natural malice keeper. It's, it's just normal. You are very effective at it. You can tell people when they offend you, how they offend you, what they were wearing, the hour, the date, the time, the second. You can tell them. I was having a conversation. I told him, I said, I said, maybe I've become lazy. I don't even have the energy to hold somebody and say, you did something. I have too many things to do. It's growth. You may not be that way now, but you can become that way. If Peter could change, you can change. If Saul of Tarsus, a murderer, can change, you can change. Somebody say, I can change. I can change. Oh, I can't hear you. Say, I can change. I can change. Because some people just say, that is who I am. That is not who you are. That is who you have become. You can become somebody better. Because there is something called tabula rasa. What that simply means is every human being born in this world is born with an empty slate. So it is your interaction with human beings, the things you hear, the things you see, that has formed who you are. God didn't create you that way. What God created, that's why we read that scripture. He says he has predestined us. If there is any predestination, is that you have been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? So he forgave his offenders. He forgave his offenders. And you and I must learn to forgive. We must learn to forgive. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 22. The Bible says, then came Peter, 18, 21 to 22, Matthew. Matthew 18, 21 to 22. And Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often should I forgive? Shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Up to seven times. Look at what Jesus said. I do not say to you up to seven times. But what? Seventy times. Seven. What is that? 490. I have said this several times humorously. If you can count out somebody offending you 490, you are jobless. And that person himself must be a demon. And you can count it successfully. One, two, three, hundred, two hundred. What are you even still doing in that environment? Peter said seven times. I'm sure maybe somebody has offended Peter six times. So he was waiting for the seven. That's why he suggested that seven to Jesus. Seven times. Up. He, you know he had the sword. And so maybe he was already thinking of how to go kill that person. So he was waiting for Jesus to approve it. He said, no, 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 no. 490, 70 times seven. He must have been disappointed. But ah! This guy for don't die tonight. <laughs> Praise God. We must learn to forgive. It is on Christ-like not to forgive. Is on Christ like. Like somebody said, I think it was Nelson Mandela that, you know, believed to have said this that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting it to kill your enemies. Ultimately, you are the one that hurts from unforgiveness. You can't be a husband, your wife does something, and two years later you say, I've not forgiven her. A Christian wife. Your husband has not done something and you have held it against him. And you are sleeping on the same bed. Are you not even afraid? 
You are sleeping on the same bed with a man you have not forgiven. Let it go. Look at your neighbor and say, let it go. No, there's a song like that if you watch Frozen. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> so just let it go. Come back to church. Leave Disney. <laughs> Any of us have gone to Disney. So just let it go. According to the Mayo Clinic in the USA, they say that holding a grudge, they did a research and they discovered that holding a grudge has a negative effect on the cardiovascular and nervous systems. They said people who thought, now listen, they are just thinking, you know, because there's no way you owe somebody or not forgiveness and they will not occupy a real estate in your mind. That's the waste of it. I don't understand why people are always engaged in it. Time that I should be using to do something productive. I'll be monitoring you. So sometimes when I hear reports like somebody's not greeting somebody in church, I'm like, how much effort? So it simply means if I decide, do you know how much effort it takes now? If I say, oh, maybe I don't want to greet Mr. Hemrod. I don't want to greet Ms. Minister Moses. So immediately after service, I have to come here. And he doesn't know, maybe he's not behind the camera, he's talking to somebody. I will come back here. <sighs> Why? You're already running mad. It's too much energy. You now be monitoring. Shoshkuru. Shoshkuru. What's your name? Why? Because really, even when you think about things, these things in practical terms, it doesn't make sense. Because there is nothing God tells us to do that is for his benefit. It is for our benefits. Let me tell you this. Some of you, that's why you are aging fast. Because you always, when you see them, just frown your face. And it takes more nerves to frown than it takes to smile. That's why you are aging. We think you are 40. You are 25. Because all your life, you have held people to your chest. Always holding people. Let that stop this month. If I'm not this month, let that stop this morning. So it said people who thought about an offense regularly experienced high blood pressure. Elevated heart rates. And increased muscle tension. That's why you notice that if you are uncomfortable with someone, once you see them, you have to just you are dying slowly because you can't just let go this is not is a research that I'm reading out to us on the contrary, they said that when you forgive, you get healthier relationships, greater spiritual and psychological well-being less anxiety, lower blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression a stronger immune system and improved heart health before that heart packs up, you better forgive. They say that the weight of unforgiveness will drag you down. It is too heavy a load to carry in the race you have been called to running. What race is that? The race of destiny. Somebody owed you 20,000 naira. Five years ago. You still remember. But why? Has God not given you much more than that? Even if they are giving you that 20,000 naira, inflation, what you will buy with 20,000, can you still buy it now? What if somebody had robbed you or you misplaced that money? Won't you live your life? I was having a conversation with someone a while back and I was telling the person about some friends that I have that are forgiving money that they cannot even remember. Just let the money go because the relationship is more important than the money. Some of us pay, no. I love you later, where My money cannot enter. Like, now that does not mean you become stupid with your finances. Get me wrong, and don't get me wrong. Because certain things you also need to understand about forgiveness is this: forgiveness is not downplaying or ignoring your pain and hurt. So we are not saying you have not been hurt. So it's not downplaying it. Forgiveness you need to understand is a choice and not a feeling. You say, ah, I'm still feeling the pain. You know, ah, I, I don't feel like it's not about the forgiveness. It's about the decision. When you make the decision, the feeling will come alongside. Forgiveness is not dependent on the offender's request or plea for forgiveness. Oftentimes, some of us say they didn't ask for forgiveness. Let me tell you this. Some people you need to forgive will never ask for it. If you are waiting for people to ask for forgiveness before you forgive, ah, you, live and, you may live eternally without forgiving anybody. As I begin to round up this morning, benefits of forgiveness. Number one is answered prayers. Answered prayers. Mark 11 and verse 25. Mark chapter 11 and verse 25. The Bible says, and when you stand praying, right? 
if you have anything against anyone, what does the Bible say? Oh, we are not reading together. Let's read again from the beginning. One to go, Matthew eleven twenty five. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your father in heaven may also do what? Forgive your trespasses. Sorry, Mark eleven twenty five. 25. Don't know what I'm saying, Matthew, right? It says, forgive. When you are praying, forgive. Another thing forgiveness does, another benefit is it secures your own forgiveness. Look at what it says. It says that your father in heaven may also forgive your own trespasses. Is what you, people did to you that you know. What about the things you did to people that they didn't tell you? We are all forgiving. We are people that have been forgiven. The reason why you are even a believer is because God forgave you. So why can't you forgive somebody else? Some people have not forgiven somebody that made a promise to them and they fulfilled the promise. Maybe your uncle told you once you come out of school, there's a job waiting for you. And no job. You got out of school after NYC, you called your uncle and he didn't pick your call. And you've not forgiven that uncle to you now. Maybe that's even a prophetic word for someone. You don't know maybe the uncle himself was going through challenges and he didn't want to disappoint you as his niece or nephew. So he just decided, let me just be quiet. When you forgive, it lowers the risks of heart attack. When you forgive, it secures your peace. When you forgive, it improves your sleep. When you forgive, it reduces your level of anxiety. When you forgive, you overcome depression. When you forgive, it improves your cholesterol level. Can't do the research. It's amazing. Number two, I'll just mention this and we'll continue from there on Thursday. Have you been blessed this morning? Yes, sir. John 18 and verse 37. John 18 and verse 37. John 18 and verse 37. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause, I was born and for this cause I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. The second thing we need to learn about Christ is that he was focused on his purpose and he was sold out to his purpose. He was focused on his purpose and he was sold out to his purpose. He said for this cause, not for these causes, for this cause, definiteness of purpose. For this cause, I was born. And for this cause, I came into the world. If I ask you this morning, why did you come into the world? You know, you couldn't have been that you came to the world to drive a fine car. That couldn't have been the reason why you're here. There's a reason you didn't come to the world in the days of Moses. Maybe you'd have been one of the slaves that built the Egyptian pyramid. There's a reason you came to the world at this time. There's a reason you are breathing now. If you are not dead, you are not done. There's a reason you are still alive. There's a reason you are still above ground. There is something for you to do on this earth. Paul the apostle said the same thing. He got to a point in his life, he said, I've finished my course. I've finished my race. What does that mean? It simply means he discovered the reason why he was on the earth. He discovered it and he focused on it. Because you can't finish what you didn't focus on. So he I said, I finished. I finished my race. I finished my race. The question this morning is, do we know why we are here? Because Jesus was not confused. On Thursday, I'm going to show us that scripture. From the age of 12, his parents were looking for him. They found him after three days. He said, why have you troubled us? He looked at his parents and said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? From that age, there was already a consciousness of destiny. There was a consciousness of purpose. There was an awareness of the reason why he came. He had not stepped fully into it, but he was preparing himself for it. Preparing himself. Let me tell you, every one of us, God has given us signs and clues into our destiny. It's just that sometimes we didn't pay attention to it. You are here to be a solution to mankind, not to be a liability. I hear what I'm saying. You are here to be a plus factor, not a minus. You are here to make someone, life's be someone else's life better. You are here to add something to our world. 
So there is nothing ordinary about you. There is nothing insignificant about you. If you are in this world at this time, it's because there is something about you. I hear what I'm saying. We'll continue from there on Thursday. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning. For the seed of your word has been sown in our hearts.